Hi, Pastor Matt Morton here, lead pastor of Cross Fellowship Church. Uh, before the message begins, I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, it is our hope and our prayer that by watching this video we uh, and hearing the message that indeed it can help you take one step closer to Jesus today. At the end of the sermon today, you'll hear me offer an invitation to the audience. And the invitation is simply to put your trust and your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're listening today or watching online and you have never done that, uh, can I just encourage you to take that step, take the step to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now maybe you have some questions or you just need to know more about that or even how to do that. At the bottom of the screen here is a telephone number. That's the church office, uh, please give that number a call. And if it's during office hours, the, the staff will direct you towards a pastor to help walk you through uh, how do you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's out of office hours, please leave a message and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching today and blessings. Thank you so much, Pastor Shara. Can we just give him a round of applause for coming here? Grateful for him and his bride, Elizabeth. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here next week as well. Um, just a heart, uh, just a, a heart for people uh, to come and know Jesus. And so um, thank you. Thank you for who you all are. All right, church, we are going to dive in here to, to finish off Matthew chapter 11. And uh, as you turn there, it's, I think, on page 62 of our scripture journals. So let me just kind of tell you a story. It was about 10 years ago, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, suffered a pretty rough tornado. And I had the privilege to take the young adults on a disaster relief trip to Hattiesburg. We were able to arrive in Hattiesburg a few months after the tornado. And so we arrived on a site where we got to really just work on a site that needed to have all the buildings cleared in order to rebuild. And one building you can see that was completely leveled. That's the kind of top two pictures there. And then uh, there was one building in the back that um, the roof had been blown off and some other structural damage, and, and it still had everything in it. It had this woman's, you know, entirety of her home and, and, and all sorts of things. And we needed to clear uh, these buildings off so we could demo them, and, and ultimately she could uh, uh, build a new home. And uh, we, uh, uh, we started making our way uh, through the house, and I was going room by room, and I, and I came to the, the back bedroom here, which was pretty small, and this is what I found. Um, that is a king-size mattress that had been sitting in the rain uh, for months. Um, I don't know if you, anyone ever moved a king-size mattress. Right? It could be heavy. Anyone ever moved a king-size mattress with like 500,000 gallons of water in it? Um, it, it felt impossible. In fact, um, you can see it like had mold, and uh, it was it was gross. Um, uh, Mike Brand was there. You remember that thing? And and I so it, it, the room was pretty tight and small, and really there was only about two of us that could fit in the room to get the mattress out. Once we got the mattress out of the door, then we'd have some other people to help us. And so I grabbed my friend David Doan. I said, "Hey, man, put on a mask. We got to go attack this thing." Um, David tried to argue, but I wouldn't let him. So off we go into this room, and, and, and we probably wrestled with this thing for, you know, probably at least an hour, just trying, just trying to maneuver it to get it outside the door. And, and, and you know, admittedly, you're like kind of giving it a little bit of distance because you don't want to get all gross and everything else. At one point, the mattress kind of fell over on David, and he got pinned up against the wall, you know, and he's completely... Uh, covered there, and then we finally are able to like taco this mattress, and we start carrying it through the door. Now, my gloves at this point are just soaked, right, um, and, and there's not a lot of, of grip, and I lose grip of this mattress, and it becomes untacoed and slaps me right in my face, right? It, it, I felt like I got hit with a water balloon, but a water balloon full of nastiness, right? And, and it's Hattiesburg, Mississippi in June. It's like 100 degrees with no breeze, right? It's 100 degrees with all sorts of humidity, and we're wrestling with this thing, and I just want it to be done, and then it slaps me in the face. I'm like, I hate this thing. I'm going to be done. I'm, I'm so over this. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm tired. 
We finally like get it out of the doorway, and, and thankfully there are some other people there, and we, and we move it on. But I tell you that story. I tell you that story because of the scripture that we are in this morning. That there's times in our lives when we are when we're weary, and we're tired, and we're exhausted. And we think we might just start to have a handle on something, and then, and then something comes up and slaps us in our face. And Jesus says, I have something for you when you find yourself in those spaces in life. Now I'll tell you, we were pretty tired, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that David was able to, uh, as, a, as a small reward, go find himself. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Oh, maybe not. I apologize. Let's see. There we go. David was able to find himself a chair. All right, he took a nap. Good for David, right? All right. Uh, let's go ahead and, and, and dig into the word. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Something really awesome takes place in the scripture here. Jesus breaks into prayer to the Father, and we get, we get to read it. We get to hear it. We get to see. He's having, he's having fellowship with the Father, and he breaks into prayer, and it's just, it's just fascinating. We get to see this. And, and he thanks God uh, for something really interesting. He, he thanks God that there are some things that are hidden. And, and, and it's these things that are hidden, and they're hidden from the wise and the understanding, and they're revealed to little children. We, we need to understand what's going on here. We need to understand what, what is Jesus thanking God for? What, what has been hidden? Well, let's talk about these things. What Jesus is referring to is everything that has taken place up to this point in his ministry, that, that indeed he is the Messiah. That it, indeed, when he's around, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak, that he is indeed the Messiah, the one which John the Baptist prophesied, that Jesus is who he says he is. It's those things. And Jesus says, thank you, Father, that, that those things are hidden, that they're hidden from the wise and understanding. Now, is Jesus criticizing the learned? Right? Is Jesus criticizing those who have knowledge or those who have wisdom? I don't believe he is. Jesus is articulating, Jesus is thanking God that these things are hidden from those who are leaning only on their own understanding. Jesus is thanking God that these things have been hidden from those who have put their faith in their own wisdom. That they think that they have God cornered. That they, they understand everything about God and they got it nailed down. And it's another sermon for another time, but God is in the heavens and he does as he pleases. And he is sovereign and so he has chosen to hide himself from those Wise and understanding, those who are leaning on their own understanding. Don't forget the passage just before this. Jesus is, is uh, casting woes upon those cities that he did all of these mighty works, and yet they still rejected them. Jesus is not criticizing knowledge. In fact, 2 Peter 3.18 tells us that we should grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace being first and being the operative word. But knowledge and wisdom can't be the end all be all. It's not what we can put our faith in. Paul tells us knowledge pops up, but love builds up. What Jesus is doing here is he's drawing out a contrast. He's drawing out a contrast simply between those who are self sufficient in their wisdom and, and knowledge and deem themselves to be wise, and, and he's contrasting those with people who are dependent and who love to learn and love to be taught when he speaks of little children. People who have childlike faith 
That's who Jesus is contrasting against the self-proclaimed wise and smart ones. And, and, and Jesus just said, thank you for doing that. And then Jesus ends his prayer and he, he starts off in verse 27. He starts speaking to his disciples. All things have been handed over to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father. No one knows the father except the son and anyone whom the son chooses to reveal him. Jesus does something really interesting here. He uses a really important word in this word, no. This word that he uses, this means no in the complete sense, in every sense, no fully. Jesus just said, hey, I fully know God. That's a big statement. That's a statement of, of deity, and that's a statement that he is the Son of God, and he is who he is. I fully know God, and God fully knows me. And then he says, I have the authority. I have the authority to reveal to whom I choose the mysteries, if you will, of God. Now, when we become saved, when we put our faith, our trust, our hope in Jesus Christ, we are enlightened, if you will. We are given a, a unique knowledge of God, not a complete, total knowledge of God that Jesus speaks to here, but we are given a deeper understanding of God, which uh, you've probably experienced this when you, you know, you're speaking to someone who maybe isn't a believer, and it's just like, they don't get it. And that's, that's biblical. God has not been revealed uh, to them yet. And so to that end, uh, I want you to, to remember here that, that Jesus, in his next statement, it's really important, but that Jesus fully knows the Father in, in every sense of the word. And that's important because the next thing that he tells us to do is he says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. So what does the statement before this one matter? Because what Jesus says here is, look, it doesn't matter what burdens you have. It doesn't matter uh, how heavy laden you are. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. I want you to know I fully know God. I am the Son of God, and I can handle whatever you got. I have the resources of heaven and earth at my fingertips. What do you got? What do you got? Now, let's talk about this idea of labor and being heavy laden, Jesus isn't speaking to the labor of trying to carry a silly wet mattress out the door. He's not talking about the labor that we experience in, in physical work. He is talking about that soul labor, that emotional labor, that stress, being heavy laden, being burdened, if you will, when we find ourselves in, in really just the chaos of this world. One translation the New Living Translation says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Another translation says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and are overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. This life has burdens, doesn't it? These soul burdens. These these experiences in life that just cause us to be weary. We live in a world that is broken. And it makes us weary and it, it burdens us. Tragedy happens. It happened this week in Maine with that uh, mass shooting. It's happened across the world with this uh, war that's taking place. We have people in our own worlds, that, people that we love dearly, that, that we just feel like they died way too soon. There's, there's a, a burden when we can't find a job, when, when employment just seems too scarce. We're burdened when there's relationships that are never supposed to end and they're dying. We get burdened for our kids, don't we? I mean, their whole life, whether they're little ones and we're not sure what they're putting in their mouth, right? Whether it's a green crayon or a green vegetable. It was green. I ate it. We're, we're worried about them at this age and then when they grow up. And sometimes we still worry about what they're putting in their mouth. We're burdened for our kids. I had the opportunity to be with um, some, uh, some United States Air Force cadets this last weekend. I uh, 
Brian and Beth Runkle, of course, uh, members here, but they lead the ministry crew there at Yusafa, and they invited me to preach um, a retreat. And, and you want to talk about some burdened souls, right? A, a cadet at the academy, brother, right? You, am I wearing the right thing? Who's going to yell at me next? Uh, you know, I, I made a mistake of saying the number in which uh, they graduated, and then everyone, you know, cheered or whatever. It's like, there's a burden that's on you. Just what's, what's next for you? But then anyone in their 20s, think about it. It's a decade of decisions. Who am I going to marry? Am I going to marry? What job am I going to do? We get buried just by, we can get burdened just by, by what decisions we have to make. Sometimes we carry burdens that are really just a product of our own doing, right? That we, we carry burdens that are the consequences of our sins. Sometimes we carry burdens of addictions or those besetting sins that just keep popping up. We all have burdens. And I would offer to you that we typically deal with our burdens in one of three ways. We either carry our burdens, we bury our burdens, or we marry our burdens. We carry, we bury, or we marry. Let me explain that a little bit. Some of us carry our burdens, and we won't let go. Now, we might be honest and vulnerable with others, and tell them, hey, I got all of this going on in my life, but don't worry about it. I don't want to burden you. you know, and we don't let go of our burdens. We don't really let other people help us. Like what it says in Galatians 6, 2, that we should bear one another's burdens. We just carry them. We don't want to let go of them. Sometimes we bury our burdens. Right? We cram them down in our soul because we don't want to talk about them. We don't want to think about them. Right? Someone asks you how you're doing, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. Please don't ask me how I'm doing again, I'm fine. And we keep pushing them down and cramming them down and cramming them down. And before we know it, something small happens, but it's the straw that breaks the camel's back, and we just crack and we fall apart. And people look at you like, what's going on with you? I didn't know you had all of this going on. Sometimes we marry our burdens. We go to bed with our burdens. We wake up with our burdens. We, we eat breakfast with our burdens. We take our burdens wherever we go. We become one flesh with our burdens. Our burdens become really the lens in which we look at all of life through. We just think, oh, woe is me. What's the next shoe that's going to drop? And so we're married to them. But Jesus, Jesus says there's a better way. Jesus tells us there's a better way. Jesus says, come to me. All of you, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me. You know, we go to so many different places when we're burdened. Typically, we don't go to Jesus first. We go to, we go to all sorts of of other places, other coping mechanisms, if you will, and in ways to try to escape our burdens. What, how, how can we find those you know, temporary escapes? Maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's binge-watching TV, maybe it's social media. Whatever it is I can do to get my mind and my soul off what's going on in my world. Sometimes we cope by going to things like self-help books. Think about that word, self-help, right? self-sufficiency. Sometimes we cope by spending money. Sometimes we, we cope by going on vacation. If you're like me, the way you cope with burdens is, all right, we're going to dig in, we're going to work harder. We, we, we just got to get after it. We just got to gotta fix it. We got to work harder, more hours, whatever it is. I call it this try harder, feel worse cycle. It's awful. Don't recommend it. Maybe we bury ourselves in our work. But notice Jesus says, come to me. Don't come to, he didn't say come to religion. He didn't say come to this book or that book or this method. He said, come to me. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like to come to Jesus? Have you ever just sat before the Lord and just thrown it all out there? 
You know, it, it tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7 that we can cast, we can throw, we can cast our anxieties on him because he cares for us. Cast, throw. Have you ever just sat before the Lord and just thrown it all out there? I don't know why this is happening. I don't like it. This hurt. God, I don't know what to do about it. I, I'm miserable. God, what do I do? God, this is yours. I, I take it. I'm casting it at you. Just vomiting it all out upon the Lord. Throwing it at his feet. Again, I just mentioned Jesus has all the resources of heaven and earth at his fingertips. He's got it. You can't cast anything upon him that he cannot handle. Now look at who this invite is to. This invite is to all. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I cannot tell you how many conversations I have had with individuals who, who, are, who are burdened and they're burdened as a product of their own poor choices and they say things like, well, I really can't come back to God. I'm not worthy to come back to God yet until I get stuff cleaned up in my life. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, come to me. No, no, you don't understand. My life is a mess. I've made it a mess. That's exactly why Jesus came to earth to clean up our mess. Come to Jesus. Friends, let me just tell you, the gap between the time that you miss it and you fail and you offend God, the the gap between then and when you come back to God, that space right there, that's Satan's playground. That's where Satan attacks you. That's where Satan attacks your self-worth. That's where Satan lies to you and says, well, you've got to get your act together before you could ever come back to Jesus. Friends, that's, that's, like, that's like getting cleaned up to take a shower. It doesn't make sense. Go to Jesus. Come to Jesus, you who, are, who, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, it's not, it's not the kind of physical rest of taking a nap in a chair somewhere. It's a soul rest. Jesus mentions it just a few statements later. It's it's a different kind of rest. It's a rest for our soul. You know, the first time that we see the word rest is in the creation story. Let me just show you the days of creation here just to remind us. Day one, God created uh, the heavens and the earth. He created uh, day and night. Day two, he created the sea and the skies. Day three, land and vegetation. Day four, the sun, the moon, the stars. Day five, um, big fish and little fish and small fish and larger birds and smaller birds and medium-sized birds. And then day six, uh, he created animals for the land and he also created man. And what happened on the seventh day? He rested. What happened on the seventh day? He rested, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. This rest comes as a product of God had completed, fulfilled, finished what he had set out to do. And so there's just a contentment. There's a a rest and contentment, a fulfillment, a peace, a shalom, Rest. Now, what day was man made? Sixth day. Man's first full day on this earth was a day of rest. See, we get this wrong. We work six days so we can rest on the seventh. No, no, no. We need to rest on the first day so we can work six. We don't work to rest. We should rest in God, be content in God, find fulfillment in God in order to to be sustained, to work. I love this idea of it is finished, right? God finished his work, and so then there's fulfillment, rest, contentment. There's nothing else to be done. There's nothing left wanting. In fact, Psalm 23, David pens, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. David is saying, the Lord is his shepherd, so there's nothing lacking. I'm not in want. Jesus says he's the good shepherd. Jesus got up on a cross and opened his arms and got nailed to that cross and said, it is finished. I have fulfilled the law. Come to me and you can have eternal soul rest. And that's sweet. 
It's that kind of rest that we can have. You can have eternal rest, but then you can also have this rest in him, knowing that no matter what happens today, no matter how bad it gets today, tomorrow is better because you are one step closer to being with him forever. Tomorrow is better no matter what if you're a Christian because you're one step closer to that eternal rest. The world is looking for rest. The world is looking for this fulfillment, this peace, if you will. In fact, Matthew 12, this just, this just struck me. Matthew 12, 43, Jesus is talking about demons. And he says, when uh, the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. The world is looking for rest in God. Jesus says, come to me, all you who, are lab- who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sin ruined original rest, but in Jesus we can have soul rest. We go everywhere else, but we should only come to Jesus. Jesus continues, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He gives us three commands here in two verses. Come to me, take my yoke, and learn from me. Now, this yoke, this word yoke, can mean two things. We, we can interpret it two ways, and they're both uh, good for our study here this morning. The first thing that we can look at is a yoke is a rabbi's teaching. Right? So there was the yoke of the law in those days. And people were, they were burdened under that law, what you can do and what you can't do and what you can wear and what you can't do on certain days. And I mean, there were so many laws, I think 623 some odd laws, like it was a heavy burden. Jesus even said, hey, you Pharisees, you go across the world and you, you bind people up with these heavy burdens, but you won't even lift a finger to help them. And they, there were people that were burdened and Jesus says, hey, look, my teaching, my yoke as a rabbi, it's really light. It's simply this, put your faith in me. I have fulfilled the law. There's rest and me, so we can look at the word yoke that way. But we can also look at the word yoke in terms of what it physically was. It was this um, big piece of wood that was carved out that was put on the shoulders of, of beasts of burden, of, of animals, in order for them to do work. And when you would yoke up two animals, it would make them work together. They would share that load, uh, and, and you, know, you could steer them the same. They wouldn't go crazy ways. And, and so that's what a yoke was used. And so in this agrarian culture that Jesus finds himself in, he gives this analogy of take my yoke upon you. Well, well, how does that work? Because I cannot carry what Jesus carries. I, I cannot, I can't, I can't do what Jesus does. Well, as I was studying this passage, I came to learn that also in those days that, that animals, you just couldn't take a yoke and, and throw a, a yoke on just an animal and they would be okay with it. They'd have to be trained under it. And so what farmers would do is they would take uh, an older, more mature animal that could carry the load, that could carry the weight, and they would yoke up that animal, and then they would yoke it to a younger, uh, more immature animal that really couldn't carry the load but needed to be trained on, uh, on how to walk. And so when we look at that picture, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. Let us learn. Let us see what Jesus did. Let us love like Jesus did. Let us, let us live like Jesus Let us learn from him. He's doing all the work. The power in you from him, he's doing all the work. And so we can be yoked to Jesus, tied to Jesus. There's still work in discipleship, don't get me wrong. But Jesus, in a cooperative effort with the Holy Spirit, is working in you and through you. Let us learn from Jesus. Let us us get into his word. Let's look at what his best is for our life. Let's live that out. See how less burdened we are when we start living the way that he commands us to. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then Jesus closes us here. I am gentle, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is not a taskmaster. And when we come to Jesus with this burden or that burden, he doesn't get frustrated with us. Seriously, you're doing this again? (sighs) No, I'm not going to give you grace this time. No, I'm not going to teach you this time. How many times is this for you that you're coming to me with these silly problems? No, no, no. Come to me. Come to me. If you're burdened, if you're heavy laden, come to me. I'm gentle and and lowly in heart means I'm humble. 
I got you. You're going to find rest, restoration for your souls. He longs to take on your burdens. Let us cast them upon him because he cares for us when we find ourselves burdened. Let us not go anywhere else. Let us not go anywhere else, but let us come to Jesus. Let us be faithful in taking one step closer to Jesus. When this world throws everything it can at you, take one step closer to Jesus. Go to Jesus. All right, let's bow our heads. This morning for our response time, I want to just do it just a little bit different this morning. I want to lead us in a, a time of some guided prayer. And I started this message speaking about how what, what has been revealed to those who are not putting their faith in their wisdom or their knowledge, but it's been revealed to, to little children, to those who have childlike faith, who, those who are willing to learn, those who are poor in spirit, those who can say, I have nothing I can bring to the table, God. I am spiritually bankrupt. Maybe you are here today and you are recognizing in your own life that you are spiritually bankrupt. That when you hear about God's perfect, righteous, holy standard, you recognize there's just no way I can meet that standard. I have, I've made a mess of my life and I need Jesus to help me with this mess. Look, if that's you, if you never put your, your faith, your trust, your hope in Jesus Christ, in a moment I'm going to lead us in some guided prayer and, and I'm going to do what's called the ABC prayer that you admit that you're a sinner, that you believe that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for those sins and rose again on the third day, and that you confess to God in this prayer that, that you want him to be the Lord of your life. A, B, C. I'm going to lead us in, in a time of prayer here in a moment. And if that's you, all I'm asking you to do is say that prayer silently in your heart and mean it. Now, brother, sister in Christ, I'm going to lead us in a, in a time of prayer because we probably have some business to do about some burdens that we've been carrying or some burdens that we've been burying or maybe some burdens that we've decided to marry. So let's pray. Father God, you are good, you are awesome, you are incredible, the creator of heaven and earth, the designer of rest. Thank you. And God, I pray right now as there are some in this room that are searching for rest, eternal soul rest in you. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you draw them right now. Holy Spirit, I, I ask that just as your word says, that you convict them of their sin and show them their need for Jesus right now. you want to ask Jesus into your life, just repeat this prayer after me in your heart and mean it. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died for my sins and rose again on the third day. God, I want to confess to you. I want to ask for your forgiveness, and I want to confess that Jesus Christ, I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. Father God, hear our prayers. Now, church family, with, with heads bowed and eyes closed, let me just guide you through some things here. The first thing that, that, that before we pray, I'm just going to ask you, go ahead and, and bring it to your mind. Bring it to your soul, what, what's burdening you right now. Just put it on your mind. Father God, there's no way I could possibly know everything that's, that's taking place in people's souls right now, but you do, and I praise your name for that. And so God, as, as these burdens have been brought to, to our mind and to our, our hearts, Lord, I, I ask that you first hear our prayers uh, of confession and repentance 
because we're either carrying them or burying them or marrying them. And so, God, I just ask that you, uh, that you hear us as we repent uh, of not coming to you, but, but taking it on ourselves. Now, family, as you continue to pray, I would also ask that you take an inward look here. Where have you been going? Have you you been going to Jesus? Have you been going to other places? Confess that now. Here we go. Here's the beauty, God. Your word tells us, Jesus, you said, come to you. And so, family, let's do it. Let's start casting some cares upon our Father. Let's start putting our burdens at his feet. Let's throw them out there. God, you are good. We cast our cares upon you because you care for us. We cast our burdens upon you because you can handle it, because you're God and we're not. And so, Lord, we give these to you in this moment. And, Lord, we don't want to pick them up again. They're yours. God, we pray for rest. Pray rest for our souls. Restore us now. Let us have our fulfillment and our contentment. Father God, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.